All right. All right. All right. Hello, everybody. I am Sage Raider, and I'm here with my good buddy, Bruce Cryer. What's up, Bruce? Hey, Sage. It's great to see you, man. Great to see you. We are here today to talk about, uh, for about the next 20 minutes, breathing and thinking and the combination of breath and thought and why it is that thought is required for breath to reach heart coherence in the heart math system. So Bruce, very briefly for people, they can find your bio and everything elsewhere, but you created the system, wrap it up, co-created, co-founded and where it's gone. And then the next sort of 30 to 60 seconds, explain what it is so that for those who don't know, they'll have a frame of reference for what we're talking about. Sure. So thank you for the opportunity and just to hang out with you is cool. So yeah, HeartMath is an organization that started out a little more than 30 years ago to prove if we could through mainstream scientific research that the heart is an intelligent system and that the heart is not simply a pump as Western medicine had taught us to believe. And so through very rigorous research using mainstream methods, not alternative methods, uh, through lots of experimenting with literally thousands of people, I was a guinea pig in any number of, of, of studies, we, just, we began to see that our emotional state slash thoughts have a direct and immediate impact on the rhythmic patterns that our heart is producing. And why do rhythmic patterns matter? The rhythmic pattern of a heart when we are stressed out looks like an earthquake. The rhythmic pattern of a heart when we're feeling grateful, when we're thinking excitedly about the future, when we have an intention to be uh, positive and kind and generous, those emotion, those positive feelings allow the heart to move into the sine wave kind of pattern, which seems healthier, earthquake versus sine wave. Boom. So there it is. So that is called coherence. Exactly. And coherence, I think, is defined or is co-defined with fidelity as balance and equivocation between all parts, fidelity between all parts. And so coherence, when the waves are in that beautiful sine wave pattern, that's what it's called, coherence. Why do we want to achieve that? What, what's the good of that? Because our conversation today is predicated on the concept that we want to be healthy, that we want, that we want to grow, that we want to do something different with our lives, right? So if we want a positive forward thinking trajectory, why is it that we have to think and breathe in a certain way to achieve something called coherence? Why does that matter? Well, to go back to that visual, the, the chaotic rhythm versus the smooth rhythm, it would intuitively would seem like the chaotic one, you're spending a lot of energy for not a lot of outcome. And when the pattern is like that, it's because you're frustrated or angry or depressed or worried. Those feelings are not generating a positive outcome, usually. However, it would also make sense if the pattern is very smooth and no obstructions, no hiccups in the pattern, you would, it would imply energy savings. So right there, it's like you're saving energy. You're, you can spend a lot of energy being in a chaotic internal state. And that is affecting your brain as well as your heart, as well as every cell in your body. Or you can be saving energy and using energy most efficiently by being in this other pattern that's very energy efficient, allows the brain to get coherent in harmony with in, in training or in fidelity with the, with the heart. So it's, it's about energy efficiency. It's about what's the optimal state where we can spend the least amount of energy for the greatest possible outcome. I love that. Okay, so given that that's the case, Talk to me about your experience with breath. If you were a guinea pig, you've been playing around with this from the very beginning, which I love. I took it out of the, out of the showroom, drove it like I stole it on the street, kind of scuffed it up a little, wrecked it, put it back together again, and, and created neuroacrobatics from the basis of everything that I learned that you pioneered. So talk to us about breath. First of all, how many years did you spend breathing? When you started at the beginning, was it Coherent? How did you figure in 5.6 or five seconds? Uh, Stephen Elliott does six seconds. And there's all these conversations about types of coherent breath, right? And varieties. And some of them relate to spiritual practices like the Kriyas, where you're working with light, imagination, right? So you're activating imagination, imagining light and bringing it in in your imaginal mind. All of that was going on around or similarly previous and post heart math. How did you and Doc Childer, the founder, wrestle something down? And what was your initial breath experience like in the early days? Great question. So 
starting in 1991, that's when the Heart Math Institute began. The research began very quickly. That was one of the primary things we wanted to get started with right away. And it took a little little bit of time to develop, you know, before we had anything ready to publish uh, that we could uh, get vetted by you know, serious uh, scientists. But one of the things that we uncovered in our exploration of, of the heart and the various mechanical dimensions of the heart, the cardiovascular dimensions, electromagnetic dimensions, rhythmic dimensions, the fact that it's an oscillating system, the fact that it's a hormonal gland, all the things that we were discovering that the average person, even the average cardiologist was kind of writing off, well, who cares about all that stuff? It's a pump and that's the main thing. Well, we realized there was, there was so much going on and the respiratory sinus arrhythmia, which in medicine is, is RSA, refers to this kind of ideal breath, so to speak, five seconds in, five seconds out. And we, as we began to do research, we realized this is a great handle because scientists can buy into this. Respiratory sinus arrhythmia is a, a, a medical fact. It was very important to us in our attempt to bring the heart to the world that we do it through scientific credibility. And that meant leaders of organizations, corporations, governments, school districts, whatever, needed to respect that we had done our homework, scientifically speaking. So if we had a, a random reason for 5.6 or 6 seconds or something, they'd be, oh, sorry, I'm just, I, you had me until then, and now, now you've lost me. So by having it tied to a physiologic parameter, which was not random either, we, we truly believe that th that rhythm is valuable to the system for a reason. And we, we discovered fairly quickly that you do roughly, it doesn't have to be exactly five seconds. If you're older and you need to breathe a little quicker, or if you're younger and you want to breathe a little longer, it's not like something bad happens if you don't do exactly five seconds in, five seconds out. But it was an easy thing for people to remember. And who came up with that? Sorry to interrupt real quick. Who was like, try five. Well, it was the discovery of the respiratory sinus arrhythmia being a significant factor in the overall health of the system. And so I, I'm not sure who specifically at that point, you know, it's all a bit of a, a blur back in those days. It's been a while. And I wasn't the lead researcher. I was more on the program development and program delivery side of things anyway. You know, I was one of the creators there with the founder, Doc Children. But um, it, it, it was a general sensation. As we started practicing too, it's like, oh, this this feels right. Five seconds in, five seconds out. That's slower than is comfortable for for certain people that have never done any kind of breath work. But again, easy to remember: five in, five out. It's not it's not that hard. And our emphasis, however, was that this is to really get in coherence and sustain it goes beyond breathing. That it and and we've tried to distinguish because sometimes, especially as years went on, more and more breath work techniques were becoming. Uh, known to the general population. And so they would say, well, you know, if, if, if your technique is so much about breath, why not just teach it as a breath work thing? And we said, well, it's, it's more than that, because what we really discovered was that achieving physiological coherence in your body is one thing. To, to achieve emotional coherence in our perceptions of life, about our perceptions of bad shit that happened today, <laughs> requires yep. more than just a physiological shift. Oh. And we realized that- Wait, until... stop. Gotcha. Requires more than a physiological shift. So if we're just dinkusing around with our breath, okay, I'm gonna shift a gear, I'm gonna push a lever, I'm gonna pull a thing and I'm gonna take a pill like Adderall. Oh, if I breathe four, seven, eight, if I breathe in four, hold eight, exhale eight, hold four. You can do the patterns, but if you don't actually deal with the emotional coherence and the emotional body, and this is what I've been spending a lot of time with personally and professionally, personally always first, how does my emotional body and my breath commingle? Because my breath body, which is my concept, my breath body, I'm sure that it's actually not mine. I have appropriated it from the Rosicrucians. Sorry, Rosicrucians. Um, the breath body and the emotional body are the same body. So you just touched on something very, very almost heretical in, a, in an age where everyone is preaching that breath and breath is enough. Just breathe and breathe like this and do it with me because look at these people flopping around on the floor having a spiritual experience because of my power. If we do not deal with our emotional regulation, which is psychological, thank you, Dr. Litchfield and the professional school and everybody who's been doing it for decades in that vein, you just said it. Our breath alone is not going to work. Talk to me about the relationship then from your breath to heart coherence to emotional. Where, where is that bridge and how did you prove that one out? 
Yeah. Well, there's a there's a, a famous graph which I, I sort of already um, gave you a hint about with this discuss, discussion of the chaotic rhythm of the heart when we're feeling frustrated or angry or whatever quote stressful emotion you could have compared to what the heart's doing when you're feeling appreciative or grateful or compassionate or or having a fun feeling any of those things so it was in the study of that in the early 90s around 93 probably when we would bring people into the lab and this was hundreds of people and we would ask them to simply think about things in their life that made them feel frustrated it didn't matter what it was just think about it and try to kind of get worked up like you're really feeling it right now right and they did that for a few minutes. It could be the dog, the mother-in-law, the, the 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 paycheck, whatever, whatever way. The the twelfth atmospheric river to hit Santa Cruz County, where the heart math is based. My daughter still lives. Um, whatever it is. And so, sure enough, on just about everybody, that produced this very chaotic earthquake-looking pattern, completely unpredictable, disordered, incoherent was the term we used to describe it because there was no sense of regularity or order to the pattern. But if you would ask that same person, and we did this numerous times, okay, now shift. Now continue to breathe like you've been doing. You've just been breathing as, as you would. Now focus on things that you appreciate in your life. Your spouse, the garden, a time on the by the lake, a time in the beach, a time in the forest, a great piece of music that just makes your heart come alive. Focus on those things as you breathe. And now let's watch what happens. And there's this one famous graph, which has been republished over 10,000 times in various scientific articles, books, magazine articles, et cetera, that shows the distinction of that earthquake pattern versus this beautiful sine wave pattern. The difference was the emotional focus. So this focus for the earthquake was the chaos in your life. Guess what happens in the heart? When the focus is the joy and the balance and the happiness in your life, guess what happens to the rhythm of the heart? So it was very clear to us that while breathing alone can help to smooth out the chaotic mm -hmm. rhythm, no question it can, because yep. you're you're diminishing some of those biochemicals that are ca causing your system to go haywire. Yep. You're doing that. You're, you're bringing some balance into the autonomic nervous system, which is what's driving the, the, the rise in heart rate and the, and the, as well as the decline in heart rate. So you're bringing those systems into the balance just by breathing. But you're not necessarily, it's like the old count to 10 and then hit the guy. You know, in other words, <laughs> you can delay the reaction, but you haven't necessarily tra transformed the reaction. Right. And so I, I want to jump in there because I think that's a great place to end part one. Is if you're doing breath alone and you're not doing thought that creates an emotional felt sense of joy or rapture or love or something juicy. So love, joy, faith, hope. I think the big three, according to the occultists, Manly P. Hall and the theosophists, and I think even Joe Dispenza proved it out, is faith, hope, and love. The big three. Faith in what? I don't know, something bigger than me. Hope in what? Something not me, because I can only find so much internal anything when I'm in a dark place. And so, yeah, finding it inside is referencing something larger, and I often have to go to a sense of the larger yeah. And then find that thing that I've found there here when I'm in a dark place. And we could argue with people who feel that that's the wrong way around or there's an order to that or you never go outside for a source of anything. But when I think and breathe and I orient my inner world, I'm yeah. able to create an outer world that I love to live in. It's like a Polaroid negative. That's how old I am. I used to peel the thing off like psh, and there'd be a picture and a picture. And one was the opposite of the other. It's a reflect, refractory nature of light. And so when we think and breathe in a very specific way, we create an internal world that then patterns to the world around us. Breath alone is not enough. The end of part one, we'll be right back. We'll have another chat with Bruce Cryer from HeartMath. Thank you, Bruce. Bruce. <laughs> Way to blow it at the last line, well, Sage. Well said, well said. Thanks, uh, Bruce Cryer. Appreciate you, man. We'll, uh, we'll see you again. Talk soon. Awesome.